to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation. So today I want to show you a little bit of our understanding of high performance cooling only viable through additive manufacturing and also show some applications that could be beneficial for the dye and mold sector. So um, in the beginning, I want to give a short introduction on why we chose this topic. Um, next to that, I'm going to go a little bit into the design process um, behind this choosing of the structure. Then we're going to show some simulations that we did in order to further refine these structures. Then the manufacturing, additive manufacturing, obviously, and then the experiments that we did for the cooling. And last but not least, some application fields that also might be viable. So just um, in short, you can see these are, I want to say, really interesting structures. I'm going to go a little bit more into detail. Um, but this is basically one fourth of what which we manufactured of a demonstrator. And I think, so why did we do it? Firstly, looking at the dye and mold sector in comparison to other additive industries, I think we are already quite good if you compare that, for example, to automotive, which is obviously a bigger sector. So, but still, there is some room for improvement um, there. So we actually did a survey um, in the dye and mold industry with German and Brazilian partners. So we asked 60 partners, so it was a big survey, but we've asked 60 partners or 60 companies, um, did you do additive manufacturing so far? Would you like to try it? And especially one question that stands out was, so where would you like to use additive manufacturing? So we have some companies that already use additive manufacturing, some companies that don't, but where do you see the most potential of additive manufacturing in the dye and mold sector? And so the overall conclusion was that definitely the biggest um, emphasis should be put on injection molds and inserts. So this is also expressed by um, one quote uh, from this study. Um, for mold inserts and sliders, the conformal cooling in particular was manufactured additively. So that was by one partner that already um, did had the additive manufacturing process in-house. So when it, term, when it comes to terms of conformal cooling, we've just heard in the past presentation, it's, we're not the only ones doing it. But um, let's have a short look at the basics, um, so to speak. So on the left side, you can see what does it look like if you have, for example, a conventional cooling. So you put holes into your block. Um, you have to uh, fill those holes in some places. Um, and then these are quite simply just through drilling manufacturing. If we go to conformal cooling, and we've seen this, we maybe have the snake-like structure, um, these meandric structures, still, I want to say, simple cooling channels. Looking at this from the side, you can see if you have a hole and a more complex surface on top, you have temperature differences between just because of the difference in height between your tool insert, basically, um, and your cooling channel. If you have conformal cooling, you can more or less adapt to this change in height. But looking at the top, if you still have simple holes, basically, or snake structures, you still have some places that are further away from your cooling structures, some places that aren't. So the question is, what can we do in order to get a uniform cooling um, exactly where it's needed? So one way to achieve that, you can see um, some simulation on the right side. So the question is, OK, down below, we have the conventional cooling. And we can already see that in the edges of the tool, it gets um, the hottest, basically. And in the middle, you have a cooling effect. If you look at the conformal cooling that sort of go along um, the curvature of the part, you can see it's a more even heat distribution. However, what this simulation doesn't really show, if you look at it from the top, you still have cold and hot, hot spots. And what we want to do is we want to use cell structures. Um, you can see on top that have basically follow the curvature of your tool um, just below where it's needed. And these ones can be applied to any tool design. And what you achieve there is that you can get a, I want to say, real conformal cooling that has a very um, yeah, a very good um, capability of transferring the heat from the whole surface um, very yeah, similarly. 
So then we thought, OK, cell structures seem to be the best option. So what cell structures do we have in additive manufacturing, just as an overview? I'm a researcher, so I don't want to go into too much uh, detail and bore you with it. Um, but just shortly, so you have stochastic cell structures, uh, basically random uh, cell structures. There you have closed foam and open foam. And if you look at non-stochastic cell structures, probably 3D letters in additive manufacturing. Everybody uh, knows this. Maybe support structures, maybe some lattice structures in the part. But you also have 2D lattice structures. Uh, if you look at compound material or if you open up a package from Amazon, you already see a 2D cell structure in the, uh, in the outside. So we looked at 3D lattice might be the best option because you have uniform um, properties in each direction. So what do we have for 3D lattice structures? So we have strut-based structures and surface-based structures. So you see strut-based structures, I think, very commonly used in additive manufacturing. Surface-based structures, not so much, because they are much harder to describe mathematically. Um, but for manufacturing and additive, it doesn't really make a difference. You can still manufacture them quite well. So looking at these surface-based structures, there's one design um, that's called a TPMS structure, triply periodic minimal surface structures. So they have a mean curvature of zero. What does it mean? It means that if you look at the surfaces and where two surfaces meet up, they don't have any edge connecting. You don't have any sharp corners, any dead zones, um, for example. So it's all a smooth transition between surfaces. So you have a couple of options of TPMS structures. But why do we choose TPMS structures? So if you compare them, for example, to strut-based structures, um, in terms of mechanical load, they just perform better. In terms of conduction, which is very interesting for the uh, dye and mold cooling applications, if you have a look, so they are better than stochastic foams because they have a more uniform um, heat conductivity. Um, and they are better than strut, ba strut based structures, obviously, because there you only have um, the conductivity in some smaller parts. So, Looking at the convection, those structures are really good if a media flows through it because you don't have sharp edges and corners. You have um, less pressure loss in your tool if you run some cooling through um, because of the smooth transition of the surfaces. So there um, you can realize complex geometries and still um, get a good structure for um, the flow of media. And Last but not least, if you look at manufacturing, um, only 3D printable. Um, that's why we're here. And they are self-supporting. So you don't need support structures inside these channels because you wouldn't be able to get them out anyway. So we chose, OK, we want to use TPMS structures. But there are a lot of different TPMS structures. And you, what we did is we designed these um, with parameters that we can quickly adapt because we wanted to reach the optimal cooling. So there are some influences on the cooling. Firstly, you have the media. And secondly, you want to have a look at how does convection versus, um, versus the conductivity behaves. So if you don't have a good conductivity in your tool, it doesn't matter if you have good convection because you don't get the heat out. This is a simulation done in ANSYS um, where we just had like this um, forced uh, convection, so we, we pushed air um, through this part. And what you can see is that um, we have good flowability, um, yet there are some places um, where it's just narrower, so where you have uh, more pressure. This is where you would lose some of your cooling effect, basically. So these structures are really complex. Um, you have a lot of different designs. So we did a lot of different simulations just to get the best out. So what do you want to achieve? Firstly, you want to have a good flow rate um, of your cooling media, because that determines how much heat you can pull out of the tool. Um, secondly, you want to minimize the pressure drop in this tool. Um, then on the left side, you can see um, we did some investigations on the wall thickness. In general, you have the best um, or it's good for the flowability if you have very tiny, small wall surfaces or like thicknesses. 
Um, however, you do have to uh, look for the printability of that because you can't go under one spot size of laser, which I would say is still, uh, I would still put some melt beads one to another. Looking on the right side, you can only see, also see that the pressure drop um, gets decreased if you have um, smaller wall thicknesses. So, um, however, I have to say, you also have to look at the conductivity, because if you have smaller wall surfaces, your conductivity decreases. And this is a big, I want to say, um, you have to have a trade-off between the flowability and your conductivity, and you have to do a lot of simulations based on which media flows through and what density you achieve overall in your TPMS structure. So, looking at manufacturing, I think everybody's seen a powder bed fusion process. However, I think this one looks particularly nice because you can see that it's um, almost artistic. Um, so, we manufactured this on a Rainshaw machine tool um, out of 316L. So, I want to say quite standard material. And so, why do we use additive manufacturing? Firstly, you cannot manufacture these structures any other way. Secondly, uh, you don't need any sealing because you can manufacture the part as a whole. Depowdering is a challenge, I have to admit. Um, so you do have to get some air pressure in and do some, um, some twisting when depowdering, basically. Um, but what you can also do, which we did in our demonstrator, uh, we used the build plate and we put it on top of the build plate and we regarded the build plate sort of as a basis, for example, for an injection molding tool. So you could also um, manufacture these directly on a flat surface injection molding tool. So the demonstrator, um, bottom right, short explanation. So in the middle, um, we have the, uh, the media is basically inserted into this uh, cooling structure. Then we have four outlets on the side. And the overall goal was to cool this as much as possible. So we did some experiments. How good was the cooling? Um, you can see we did um, basically two different tests. One on the left side, the uh, temperature was measured at the bottom of the build plate, and we're talking about a really thick build plate, uh, maybe 40 millimeters. And you can see after the valve is open, um, of course, in the middle where the media is present first, uh, you get the first drop and you get the best cooling effect. Looking at the um, right side, so we started at room temperature, and we used uh, CO2 as a media. So through expansion of CO2, it gets really, really cold. That's why we went down to uh, minus 65 degrees. And you can also see that um, the probe in the middle was the coldest. So what you can also see on the right side is some, some I want to say, not uniform cooling. So you have some ups and downs. So why did this happen? Um, there's still some room for improvement. So on the right side, you can basically see um, this is an A times speed. Uh, you can see the cooling uh, through a thermo, thermo camera. Um, you see that first um, you do have a conductivity between the um, basically the heat exchange structure and your base plate. So it basically cools your whole base plate, but it gets really cold really quick in cooling. On the left side, we see where we had this um, up and down uh, in the temperature because we were so cold that we actually um, created snow uh, on the build plate. Um, also, through expansion of uh, CO2, you can also create snow. So this is something that we will have to look into. Um, however, if you want to have a really good cooler, I think this is one of the really good options. So applications, um, of course, um, dye and mold. We already talked about it. You would be able to reduce your cycle times. Uh, you can use water or oil as media. It um, doesn't really matter. You do have to be aware of depowdering. So this is um, something you have to be aware of. But you can also use CO2 as a media. In general, CO2, so it's now the big bad word, but um, industrial CO2 is basically a waste product that gets created um, through various chemical processes. So we're not putting new CO2 into the atmosphere. It would be there anyway. But what can you do as well? So heat exchangers, um, hot oil versus cold oil, because you can have also two separate uh, media that are basically um, separated from one another. Um, then for batteries, uh, you can use this as a cooling strategy for batteries. Um, 
bottom left, heat sinks for electronic, so you don't even need um, forced, uh, um, forced cooling. You can just use passive cooling um, through air or um, cooling of, um, for example, electrical components, AC-DC converters, um, but I want to say in a more high price sector. So I want to uh, go into a short discussion maybe, what would your application be? Um, if you have further questions after this presentation, feel free to visit us um, at 11.1 D39, just over there. And um, I'm honored to give this presentation today. This is, uh, most of this work was done by my colleague, uh, Yannick Fasselt. He's writing his PhD thesis on this. However, he was unfortunately not able to make it today. Thank you so much. So does anybody have an interesting application that they think this could be used for? And if not, what is your favorite application that you've seen so far? Ooh. Or maybe the most impactful, maybe so. I want to say probably die and mold sector, definitely, because um, it's a big industry, especially in Germany. Um, we have millions of parts. If you can there reduce cycle times, uh, you need, you just save so much energy in total. And I think um, even though the parts are more expensive than conventional parts, especially if you have a tool that's running for 100,000 parts, mm -hmm. uh, you do get a cost benefit at the end. How about for things like um, electric vehicles? Is there big cooling requirements with the amount of energy that's uh, involved Def there? Definitely, but if you look at the automotive sector, I think looking at metal parts right now in the whole industry, we are not there with, that we can put in serial manufactured parts in this size in every electric vehicle. So maybe racing sports, but this is not the big impactful Thing. Formula One has always has the money to do these D things. Yeah, they Maybe do. They do. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.